Louisa May Alcott, an introduction. Many great writers are defined and remembered by one piece of work, one novel or poem that embeds itself in society. For Louisa May Alcott, it was Little Women, enjoyed by every generation since its publication. Born in 1832 in Germantown, Pennsylvania, into a poor family, she received part of her education from family friends such as Henry David Thoreau, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Nathaniel Hawthorne. These early influences on the young Louisa weaved into her early life and provided much of the material for her later novels. She was also a poet and a short story writer. Here we have gathered together some of those stories which present her in a very different light. This is a chance to explore her take on other subjects in a different discipline. These stories are read to you by Patricia Rodriguez, Richard Mitchley, Eve Karp, and Gisela Rowe. From Hospital Sketches by Louisa May Alcott 1. Obtaining Supplies I want something to do. This remark being addressed to the world in general, no one in particular felt it their duty to reply. So I repeated it to the smaller world about me, received the following suggestions, and settled the matter by answering my own inquiry, as people are apt to do when very much in earnest. Uh, write a book, quoth the author of my being. Don't know enough, sir. First live, then write. Try teaching again, suggested Mother. No, thank you, ma'am. Ten years of that is enough. Take a husband like my Darby and fulfill your mission, said Sister Joan, home on a visit. Can't afford expensive luxuries, Mrs. Kubiddy. Turn actress and immortalize your name, said Sister Vashti, striking an attitude. I won't. Go nurse the soldiers, said my young brother Tom, panting for the tented field. I will. So far, very good. Here was the will. Now for the way. At first sight, not a foot of it appeared, but that didn't matter, for the periwinkles are a hopeful race. Their crest is an anchor, with three cockadoodles crowing atop. They all wear rose-coloured spectacles and are lineal descendants of the inventor of aerial architecture. An hour's conversation on the subject set the whole family in a blaze of enthusiasm. A model hospital was erected, and each member had accepted an honourable post therein. The paternal P was chaplain, the maternal P was matron, and all the youthful P's filled the pod of futurity with achievements whose brilliancy eclipsed the glories of the present and the past. Arriving at this satisfactory conclusion, the meeting adjourned, and the fact that Miss Tribulation was available as army nurse went abroad on the wings of the wind. In a few days, a townswoman heard of my desire, approved of it, and brought about an interview with one of the sisterhood which I wished to join, who was at home on a furlough, and able and willing to satisfy all inquiries. A morning chat with Miss General S. We hear no end of Mrs. Generals, why not a Miss? Produced three results. I felt that I could do the work, was offered a place, and accepted it, promising not to desert, but stand ready to march on Washington at an hour's notice. A few days were necessary for the letter containing my request and recommendation to reach headquarters, and another containing my commission to return. Therefore no time was to be lost. And heartily thanking my pair of friends, I tore home through the December slush as if the rebels were after me, and like many another recruit, burst in upon my family with the announcement, I've enlisted! An impressive silence followed. Tom, the irrepressible, broke it with a slap on the shoulder and the graceful compliment, Oh, Treb, you're a trump! Thank you, then I'll... Take something, which I did, in the shape of dinner, reeling off my news at the rate of three dozen words to a mouthful. And as everyone else talked equally fast and altogether, the scene was most inspiring. 
As boys going to sea immediately become nautical in speech, walk as if they already had their sea legs on, and shiver their timbers on all possible occasions, so I turned military at once, called my dinner my rations, saluted all newcomers, and ordered a dress parade that very afternoon. Having reviewed every rag I possessed, I detailed some for picket duty while airing over the fence, some to the sanitary influences of the wash-tub, others to mount guard in the trunk, while the weak and wounded went to the work-basket hospital to be made ready for active service again. To this squad I devoted myself for a week, but all was done, and I had time to get powerfully impatient before the letter came. It did arrive, however, and brought a disappointment along with its goodwill and friendliness, for it told me that the place in the armory hospital that I supposed I was to take was already filled, and a much less desirable one at Hurley Burley House was offered instead. That's just your luck, Trib. I'll tote your trunk up garret for you again, for of course you won't go, Tom remarked, with a disdainful pity which small boys affect when they get into their teens. I was wavering in my secret soul, but that settled the matter, and I crushed him on the spot with martial brevity. It is now one. I shall march at six. I have a confused recollection of spending the afternoon in pervading the house like an executive whirlwind, with my family swarming after me, all working, talking, prophesying, and lamenting, while I packed my go-abroady possessions, tumbled the rest into two big boxes, danced on the lids till they shut, and gave them in charge, with the direction, If I never come back, make a bonfire of them. Then I choked down a cup of tea, generously salted instead of sugared, by some agitated relative, shouldered my knapsack, it was only a travelling bag, but do let me preserve the unities, hugged my family three times all round without a vestige of unmanly emotion, till a certain dear old lady broke down upon my neck with a despairing sort of wail. Oh, my dear, my dear, how can I let you go? I'll stay if you say so, mother. But I don't. Go, and the Lord will take care of you. Much of the Roman matron's courage had gone into the Yankee matron's composition, and in spite of her tears, she would have sent ten sons to the war had she possessed them as freely as she sent one daughter, smiling and flapping on the doorstep till I vanished, though the eyes that followed me were very dim, and the handkerchief she waved was very wet. My transit from the gables to the village depot was a funny mixture of good wishes and goodbyes, mud puddles and shopping. A December twilight is not the most cheering time to enter upon a somewhat perilous enterprise, and, but for the presence of Vashti and neighbour Thorn, I feared that I might have added a drop of the briny to the native moisture of the town I left behind me, though I'd no thought of giving out. Oh, bless you, no! When the engine screeched, Here we are! I clutched my escort in a fervent embrace and skipped into the car with as blithe a farewell as if going on a bridal tour. Though I believe brides don't usually wear cavernous black bonnets and fuzzy brown coats with a hairbrush, a pair of rubbers, two books and a bag of gingerbread distorting the pockets of the same. If I thought that anyone would believe it, I'd boldly state that I slept from C to B, which would simplify matters immensely. But as I know they wouldn't, I'll confess that the head under the funereal coal hod fermented with all manner of high thoughts and heroic purposes to do or die, perhaps both, and the heart under the fuzzy brown coat felt very tender with the memory of the dear old lady, probably sobbing over her army socks and the loss of her topsy-turvy trib. At this juncture, I took the veil, and what I did behind it is nobody's business. But I maintain that the soldier who cries when his mother says, Goodbye, is the boy to fight best and die bravest when the time comes, 
or go back to her better than he went. Till nine o'clock I trotted about the city streets, doing those last errands which no woman would even go to heaven without attempting, if she could. Then I went to my usual refuge, and fully intending to keep awake, as a sort of vigil appropriate to the occasion, fell fast asleep, and dreamed propitious dreams till my rosy-faced cousin waked me with a kiss. A bright day smiled upon my enterprise, and at ten I reported myself to my general, received last instructions and no end of the sympathetic encouragement which women give in look, touch, and tone more effectually than in words. The next step was to get a free pass to Washington, for I'd no desire to waste my substance on railroad companies when the boys needed even a spinster's might. A friend of mine had procured such a pass, and I was bent on doing likewise, though I had to face the president of the railroad to accomplish it. I'm a bashful individual, though I can't get anyone to believe it. So it cost me a great effort to poke about the Worcester depot till the right door appeared, then walk into a room containing several gentlemen and blunder out my request in a high state of stammer and blush. Nothing could have been more courteous than this dreaded president, but it was evident that I had made as absurd a demand as if I had asked for the nose off his respectable face. He referred me to the governor at the state house, and I backed out, leaving him no doubt to regret that such mild maniacs were left at large. Here was a Scylla and Charybdis business, as if a president wasn't trying enough without the governor of Massachusetts and the hub of the hub piled on top of that. I never can do it, thought I.